afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Rowena Rashad. I'm the head of school of Murray House School of Education. A very warm welcome to all of you. Um, my job is really to chair this afternoon, to introduce John, and then to make sure that, uh, I think, John, you're taking questions after, and to ensure that we come to a timely finish in order for us, for those of you who want to, to go to the Lorimer room for a drink. So, um, I'm going to tell you a wee bit about John. This is my only opportunity in a public forum to embarrass John, and I intend to do so, but in a nice way. Um, I have great pleasure in hosting this afternoon Professor John Davis, Professor of Childhood Inclusion Inaugural Lecture. I know you'll be in for a stimulating and thought-provoking lecture on the topic of including children in Scotland, concepts, structures, relationships, and the common weal. John was born in Dunfermline. He was educated at Petrivi Primary and then went on to Morningside before moving on to Boroughmuir High. He has a degree in sociology and social anthropology from the University of Ulster and a doctorate in education from the University of Edinburgh. On completion of his doctorate, John worked as a research fellow of public health and there are colleagues from that part of his life, in that period of his life here today, joined Murray House um, School of Education in 2002 to develop the BA uh, in Childhood Studies, as it was known then, now known as BA Childhood Practice, and many colleagues from Murray House here and students here today. I remember John coming into the office next to mine. Um, we were both lecturers then, and I was very taken with his passion for social justice, but also even more taken with his willingness to debate and discuss controversial issues. This was someone I knew I could work with. John became head of department of educational studies, the department I was part of, and he was head until 2009. John's had a range of roles. He was, has been external examiner to the Registration of Care Award for Care Inspectors in Scotland and to programs related to childhood studies and, to pra and practice at the National University of Ireland. John chaired the Scottish Social Services Council Childhood Practice Development Group from 2009 and 2012. And he's been on many Scottish Government task and national strategy groups. John's research has examined the development of participatory childhood research methods and focused on understanding children and young people's perspectives of inclusion, social justice, and integrated working. His research has covered the national but also international dimensions. He has completed a whole range of research projects, I think 13 at the last count, 26 knowledge exchange projects, presented in over 77 conferences and 29 within international contexts. So a great amount of work. Published four books and I'm not even going to attempt the number of journal papers and articles he has written. I'm sure many of you are familiar with quite a few of those. John is a very sought after keynote contributor and I cannot possibly name all the countries. All I know is that when I turn up at a conference where it involves children's right or childhood practice in Canada or Ottawa, ultimately they will know John's name. So from Romania to Canada to Turkey to Greece to Cyprus, Ireland, New Zealand, and the list goes on and on. Now for somebody that's busy, you can just imagine in his spare time, he does want to move away from crowds. So he seeks the peace and tranquility of the countryside and I know he enjoys his precious fishing days with our mutual friend, Alan Bell, who is here this evening as well. John also hill walks with his family and has recently become a student again, I believe, completing his level one and two Scottish Rugby Union coaching awards. And he's a coach at Boromir Rugby Club. However, before handing to John, I know there are some people in this room that John would want to to have mentioned and to thank. The saying that behind every great man is a great woman, I think is very true today. And Jill has been a loyal supporter of John as he's developed his career. He also acknowledges the support of his children, Melissa, Kate, and Liam. Family plays a big part and is an important part, I know, in John's life. John has two siblings, Jenny and Mark. 
He's proud of his father, retired mechanical engineer, but he is particularly proud of his family association with the university. His mother Gladys, who is here, Gladys Davis, who worked at the university for 28 years, 16 as the old college receptionist. And I want to take my opportunity to thank you, Gladys, for your warm and friendly smiles. And as a young lecturer, going into the daunting uh, place of old college, it was very reassuring. Thank you. Indeed, the university community held Gladys in such high esteem that a portrait of Gladys now takes pride of place on the wall at the foot of old college's grand staircase, along with the likes of David Hume and Joseph Lister. John, I invite you to give your lecture. And as if by magic. <laughs> this is the picture. It says a lot. It says a lot that... Uh, Oh, oh, oh. Just give, give me a second. Didn't know that was going to happen, actually. <laughs> oh, drink of water. Yeah. Oh. We're in the building that you can see in the picture today. So it's just across the road. It gives me incredible pleasure to give this lecture. Having come as a young man and walked on these steps and looked at this building. And uh, watched my mum suck up to high agents. <laughs> <laughs> it says a lot that in Scotland, a young man can make it all the way from Birmingham up the road to here, to stand on these steps and give a lecture as a professor. It's just a shame that my mum is the only woman on that staircase. It says a little bit about the way that the university's got to go on social justice yet. Okay. So including ch children in Scotland, concepts, structures and relationships. I'm just going to I said to a friend, I'm not going to do this in a chronological order because it'll take too long and I hate people who do their inaugural lectures and talk about everything they've done. So I've tried to edit it, but I don't know if I have. So I might need to cut it a bit more as we go along. But I'm just going to go through some eras. And the, the thing I'm trying to argue is that I come to these steps because of the common wheel, because of the people in this room. And that's the kind of values that we need to take forward in a new Scotland. In 1996, I finished my PhD and I learnt a lot from young people. And one of the things was, why, sometimes I got a bit hacked off playing rugby. Why, why was I so hacked off? Sometimes it didn't fucking pass to me. Excuse my language. There's a couple of people up here who did pass them. <laughs> if you don't mind me embarrassing you. There's Bill and Kobe and Lorna later on came and even came and worked with me, so I couldn't have been that bad. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't find the video I had of you, mate. I looked for it everywhere. <laughs> um, there's a thing that happens in sport where people think it's about the size you are, but it isn't really. It's about the, whether you have the opportunity, whether you have the experience, whether we ignore the aggressive people and the tall people who just want the ball all the time. We actually find a way to pass to each other. And that's the theme of the common wheel. I wasn't that rubbish, Dave. See, the newspaper says it. <laughs> <laughs> it says... I have to run down here to read what it says. It says, John Davis is also a skillful player and unusually for a prop. Unusually for a prop. He has had considerable success selling the most outrageous dummies <laughs> and scoring tries. And this was when I was at university. The 
the thing that tickles me about it is that um, is the unusual. So people who play certain positions can't do certain things. But what was great about Kobe, first day I got in a scrum, first live scrum in a game, playing for the seconds, I think we were. I don't think it was the first, I think it was the seconds. Kobe was captain. We got in the scrum. I thought it was a great player. I really did. Got in the scrum, bang, oh, I start going backwards. He shouts over, get your side up. He didn't say it as politely as that. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe I wasn't that great a player. I was university to get your side up. And I realized it wasn't about individuals. It was about the whole team working together. It was about a sense that you wouldn't let that guy on the other side down, even though he was screaming his guts out at you. Um, so what did my PhD find? It found that it's about cultural resources. It's about structural resources. It's whether you have enough experience to understand the rules of the game. A lot of kids give up sport because they're embarrassed. They don't know how to play this thing. They don't know the rules. They come in and, and they, they can't admit their own insecurities. But, but that stems from the background they come from, whether they had the resources. And, and after 96, we started calling it social capital. But that's just a big word for having opportunities, experiences, and something underneath you that uh, enables you to achieve. It's not about the individual. The great thing about going on these SU uh, courses is, is it's enabled me to see the journey, the journey I've come, and also the journey that's going on around us. All of us are contributing to a shift in the way we work with children. And now you go on the SU courses, and it's very anti-elitist. It's against the idea that that uh, you would knock kids out of rugby early because they're no good. It's saying, well, what abilities do they have and how do we build on them? And I was lucky, I've mentioned Billy and Kobe. There was other people like Gordon Lee, people wouldn't know him here, who was in the thirds, who first picked me for the thirds before Kobe could pick me for the seconds, who helped me, saw something, helped me grow and turned me into a reasonable rugby player, a reasonable player. There's something in this picture that says it all for me. As some students may have seen this before. I've shown it at one class, I think. I, this wasn't even the most together team we had in the period I played. But there's something here about the way that the eyes are looking down. We've just played against Sterling. Top of the table decider, we've lost. There's just something about the connection between those guys there that we've all got the same feeling. And that's what the common wheel is, togetherness. And anybody who lives in Scotland can be part of the common wheel. It doesn't matter where they come from. There's guys from different places. There's guys from public school. Further on out in the picture, you'd have guys from different countries. Sean Lenin's in the picture, some of you may or may not know him. He's from New Zealand, but he wore the Scottish jersey. It doesn't matter what country you come from. You can be part of the togetherness. So the solutions that came out of the PhD were more resources, more time at home, better coaches. This is all stuff we know. Some of this is starting to be funded. You know, it's only 20 odd years, but it's starting to be funded. Um, After the PhD, I started doing work on disability. There's a whole group of people here. Some of these people aren't worth, with us anymore, like Marion Corker. And earlier in the University of Ulster, the press cutting, Barry, they mentioned Barry Watson, who was a farmer and a fireman who sadly died last year. Some people didn't make it on the journey. And, but they contributed, and we re remember them now. The, if you're going to move away from that idea that it's the tall people and the 
fast people at rugby, or you're going to move to something that's more about exclusion. Alderson says it really well. We have to stop measuring for normality and start looking for, stop the testing, stop seeing ability as a static thing, and see that there's widely different ways that young people can contribute in our society. This is the opposite, unfortunately. I want to bring Kobe in again because I was really lucky. Some of these people have followed me for years, but it just coincidentally, on one of the projects we did in disability, we went to the school that Kobe was working in. And that same man who shouted across at me and swore at me to get my side of the scrum up also had incredible sensitivity when it came to working with disabled children in that school. And that school had something that was different about listening. And it interests me that that's the opposite of what's up in that cartoon. In that cartoon, it's people who are scared. Maybe they've not had the training. It's complex. But what I want to say is some of the people in that room are teachers. Kobe's a teacher. Other teachers here in this room who don't work like that. So it's not to say there's one group of people. We all have it in us to work in a more inclusive way. But if we're scared, I remember Mary Smith uh, doing our ED. <laughs> we were spending all the time moaning about social workers. Eventually we woke up and said, let's stop moaning about them. Let's actually analyse why they're behaving that way. And they were behaving that way because they had stresses. They had pressures. And the top-down performance indicator culture in our society doesn't help that. The writing was on the wall here. We don't do inclusion. It's great that so many cool schools have shifted. But I'm also aware, working on the Masters, uh, uh, the Education for All course, and now the uh, Collaborative Working course, that, that it's a painful process for some people. And it's tough to come on that journey. But they are on that journey. Again, young people say it funny. They just say it better than I could. A lot of people think inclusive schooling consists of two things. <coughs> Lifts and ramps, wrong, that's integration. Inclusive education is where people have the right attitudes towards disabled young people. My English people that introduced Christy Brown's piece with Christy Brown was born a victim of cerebral palsy. Now, I have cerebral palsy. I've often been the victim of other people's attitudes, but I've never in my life felt myself to be the victim of cerebral palsy. So, what did we find in disability? We found something similar that we found in the project on sport. There's a need for a flexible curriculum. I've talked about Kobe's sensitivity, but there's also a need for the professionals to have the attitudes of how do we work this out? How do we remove the barriers? And the social model of disability is very much about how we remove the barriers. But what I learned in that project was it's not just the more funding, it's the people and the complexity. The social model was critiqued by Marion Corker, who was on the list I mentioned earlier, for, and, and others, uh, Carol Thomas, for being too male, for not really thinking about the fluid ways that people experience exclusion, for being multi-layered. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Try to keep it a bit simple. So after the inclusion projects, um, we did some seminars, Kay Tisdall, I can't I don't even see if Kay is here, but she is here, thank okay. you. Um, and Malcolm Hill, Alan Prout, myself, and we also wrote, for, there's very, a lot of people who worked in, who were involved in that seminar. Um, I'll mention some later on. There's something about young people, the way they, de they define social justice, the way they define rights, that it's about relationships as much as transport. It's about play, but also housing. You can't play in a home you're not proud to bring a friend to, home to from school. It's about access to legal rights. And we've written, I'll mention a little bit later on, that there's a real problem in Scotland that a lot of young people's opportunities are not enshrined in law. They're not supported by the full incorporation of UNCRC. Um, there's all, and the reason why that's important is because when children are discriminated against or silenced or ignored, as happened in Kate, 
and Liam's school recently, where the head teacher put out an edict that any child who had their hair dyed a not normal colour would not be able to attend school trips, <coughs> represent the school, or even go to the Scottish Parliament. And Kate had recently just been to the Scottish Parliament, so I did wonder what that was about. But had you been winning them up too much? I don't know. But these kind of things are just really dodgy. They're really dodgy. They shouldn't happen. It's about male power, and it should just be stopped. Um, <coughs> we've seen the opposite of that. We've seen some terrific stuff. Recently, we've had a seminar series where we've been over to Glasgow, and Christina and Marlies and others, uh, Ekogu and, and others have, <coughs> Liam Cairns, I'm trying to remember the names as they come, <laughs> uh, have been working with us in those seminars. And I would encourage you, when the links are up, they may just be up online now, when the links are out, to look at those videos of young people. I was particularly struck by a, a young man who was gay, who was in care, and the system wasn't there to understand who he was. And as his sexuality was emerging, he told his story about this. But other people from uh, Durham were talking about how the police move you on in your areas. You can't have relationships if you can't have access to social space. So we have to change things like that. I'm not sure these two should have access to social space. <laughs> they look a bit hoodie. <laughs> but of course, these two are, are my younger kids, Kate and Liam. Yeah. We have resources. We can go on cars and we can go on hills. And we can enjoy, not all kids get that opportunity. I was going to make a Billy Connolly joke there, but I'm not going to. There's a few people who've come and, and indicated that they can only come for a wee while or they'll come at the end. Or, um, yeah, so what, what you put together in a package is a family who have a dad who works at a university and a mum who goes to a... a who works at a hospital, and then you have kids who come through who are really, you're really proud of. <laughs> Can you go again? <laughs> this book's about that. It's kind of, somebody tried to insult me once. It was really funny, because I, I thought it was such a compliment. They said, you're a bit like a cottage industry. You do all these local projects like it was a sinner in some way. When it's my blood, it's my life's blood to work with people and to speak to people. And this book is that. It has examples of the different projects we've done. Local projects, listening to people's voices. All these people work with me on these projects. I'm not going to name them all because there's not time, but if you see your name up there, if I've missed your name, I'm sorry. There's a few dropped off the end of the slide, but um, it takes a lot of people to do those projects, and we work together. And then you find things out when you're doing them because you're on the ground. You're actually speaking to people. You're not in an ivory tower somewhere. You're on the ground. Yeah, and you find out that mental health services are really badly organised because a young person can just be taken away from their home to a place they've never been to before without any information on where they're going. The acuteness of their mental health issue gets exacerbated because of the way the adults dealt with the situation. That's what you find out working on the ground, working in the real world. And there's no, none of us should apologize for that. We are the lifeblood in working together. We're the people who support each other. Yeah, and I hate this thing about academic and practice. I don't see that division. There shouldn't be a division. And there's loads of people in this room who've bridged that division and understand what this kind of stuff's about. Um, when you don't get it, you get this. Professional people just sit there and look at you. This is young people talking about mental health services. Look at you if you're mad. They don't confront you. So sorry, they don't comfort you because they're not allowed to. Like friends can make you feel better because they can comfort you. They don't have to cuddle you to make you feel better. They could do it another way. But just actually make you feel like they care rather than you're a problem. In these ones, we, we kind of moved on. We're trying to do things. We've got GERFET. We're trying to do early intervention. We're trying to do things. Some things are working. 
but sometimes they don't. So this was quite interesting in terms of the shift. The young, first young quote, the young person was calling for what we would call early intervention. We need to get into families earlier who are having trouble, which is quite often poorer families. Then they wouldn't go, get so far as to have to like, use health services. This young person sees the link with the way we set things up and how we end up in acute mental health services. Um, and then the other person, so in some ways we're trying to do that with Gurfet, we've got the new name person thing and all the legal fury about that, but sometimes that doesn't even work because you go to the person who's your coordinator, this is a young man actually in Holland, who, in, on the Fiesta project I'm working with John Ravenscroft. Um, but nothing changes, so at some point it was just like, forget it. So, what, what is making the difference when we try to improve services? We learned this on the work I've been doing with Mary Smith, and I'll talk about more in a minute. What was great about working with Mary was that I would go out to Midlothian, and because of that academic practice divide not being there, Mary, and before that when I worked with uh, uh, Christine Mackay, they would, I was working with Christine Mackay when Mary handed me a book uh, by Moss and Peachy about from children's services to children's spaces. And then another time I came out and she handed me this book by Pat Dolan, John Canavan and John Pinkerton. And they've got two books that, uh, on family support. And they were arguing that we had to shift away, shift away from some kind of top-down paternalistic surveillance approach to social work and support families to have something that's more thoughtful and community-based. And really that's what the children have been telling me anyway. So they echoed really nicely together, the academic and the real world. And we kind of put it into this book, which I'm very proud of. Um, the fact that me and Mary could actually sit down and agree on something to write a book <laughs> still amazes me, but that's not true, is it? And Mary, I'm going to show something later on. Mary said uh, I'm really organized. Was I really organized doing that book? Yes. Thanks. So I'll bring it in later on. <laughs> so, uh, the, what we're arguing in that book is lack of clear concepts and oppressive structures inhibit staff capacity. And Dahlberg was saying, you know, we were talking about Alderson earlier. Dahlberg was saying all the, um, all the performance indicator cultures that apply to adults and services are based on the same concept that we must test people, that we must show them what they're doing wrong, we must point out their inadequacies in the same way that Alderson pointed that out about disabled children. So the very forces that oppress children are the same forces that oppress professionals and staff. And we are arguing in the book, you need a better understanding of local power politics to understand how services can be improved. And a classic example of that would be the Early Years Collaborative, which has loads of top-down indicators about young mothers' bodies that some people decided in grey suits yeah, as a key now, you wouldn't disagree with those indicators most of the time. But some of those indicators will have different meanings in the local context. Whether it's the politics of breastfeeding, you're saying we'll have a massive target for breastfeeding. Everybody would agree with it because that breastfeeding is a good thing. But for some women, that's not going to work. So what's your alternative to your target? Yeah? It's got to be more thoughtful than these top-down things. Similarly, we find all our students are really good at talking about anti-discrimination. They know all the, the, the PC language now. And they're quite good at being re reactive if something happens. They know they no need to do something. What we've been working on is something more proactive. And in the work I did with uh, Andy Hancock and others, um, we found that when we surveyed early year services, they didn't tend to invite people of difference to take powerful roles like run the committee, organise something. They were great on culture days. I'm sick of culture days. Great. Everybody in their essays are right about culture days. I've read so many things about culture days. Some of them sounded quite good. Actually, but when you've marked hundreds and hundreds of essays, you can like, they've got to do something 
other than a culture day. Yeah? And it's about power, the difference between a culture day and actually having people doing leadership roles is about power. One is sort of recognition that's a gift. The other one is somebody actually taking authority, a position, actually leading on something, showing their ability, recognizing their capabilities. It doesn't happen enough with people of difference, and it doesn't happen enough with people who, young people, and we find on the Fiesta project, which is about integrated working and transition with disabled children, 39.4% of services involve young people, the ones we talked about, in decision making about transition. Even lower for disabled young people, about 35%. That wasn't, that, that was actually, that was quite a good figure in some senses, but if you looked at it another way, you'd say that there's not that much difference between children and disabled children. But yeah, we've got a long way to go to think about how we shift the politics of services, if that's the figures we get. The, 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 the summary, the solutions, the things that changed in that book that we were highlighting, and I may have talked at length about these things, and other people here know more about this stuff than, than I do. But there's a whole load of ways. The one that I want to pick out is dispersed leadership. If you have a hierarchical organization, it sets the tone and the culture. If you have a hid, hidi who's putting edicts out that children should have a certain kind of normal hair color, you've not got dispersed leadership. Without a concept of dispersed leadership, you can't have participation, you can't have involvement, you can't have the common wheel, you can't have the to togetherness of that picture earlier. There's another issue for me in this as well. Gurfik's all well and good about joint assessment. But if we assess and assess and assess, and the Westminster government cuts the services and the funding to working class, not even working class families now, families without work, families who work but they're on such low income the work doesn't pay. If we live in that kind of society, it doesn't matter about Gurfik and assessment because we're actually living in a society that's so unequal that's going to override any little technical twist you can make on your services any little changes of ethos that we can make, because the big things matter. And kids tell us that. If you don't have a house that you're proud of, if you don't have a home that you can stay in because somebody's bullying you with a bedroom tax to, for your parents to move house or your mother to move house, you can't have inclusion. Why is that idea of exclusion so dangerous. Why is the idea of hierarchy, child development, testing, performance indicators so dangerous? Because it excludes loads of people from education. What's the opposite of that? What we've been doing in the School of Education with the support of a whole community of people within the childcare and early years sector. We've created the uh, BA Childhood Practice, the Child Practice Development Team, people like Francis Scott, and, Anne Brady, Sandra Tucker, Jean, uh, Jean, Joan, Jean, Joan Memuir, sorry, and uh, Anne Hughes started it all off. So when I was introduced earlier as cheering, I just cheered for a wee bit. I just hopped on the surfboard, but it was already going. The speed was already up with all these people. And there's something great about the fact that we've developed this degree, and it goes back to my mother's picture. My mother worked with children, but there was no pathway to education. There's a pathway for these women, and some young men now. We've got, we might have two this year, I think, Christina. <laughs> we need to do more work on that. And th this course gives people a pathway to education through vocational courses into a university. It's the anathema of elitism. It's saying these people had abilities that weren't recognized when they were at school, but we can recognize them now. That's the common wheel. That's the way we need to think as we go forward. Brilliant thing, and we just finished this research project that we've been doing uh, for, for the SSSC. And I was not unaware of how many of our uh, students, and I'm saying our, I mean the whole sector, not just Edinburgh University students, are now running children and family centres, are managers and are registered as lead practitioners, managers and lead practitioners. It's a huge shift. And so many of them are now also running 
uh, 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 early years services as well. There's been a massive increase in degrees in the private sector, which is a huge shift, which Scotland should be proud of and we should say that we don't need to go to Reggio Emilia in Italy, where they're very poor on working with disabled children, by the way, to find out how to do it. We know how to do it here. We have to show pride in the way we're doing it. We're the leaders. We're setting the way forward. Here's an example. My oldest daughter, Melissa. It's tough for her having to stand next to that beautiful woman all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Who could see me? So Jill and Melissa at graduation, yeah, across the road. I didn't cry this time. <laughs> so I'm getting better. So again, really proud. Melissa came through a different route. Worked to work with horses, did equine studies, did a vocational degree, but eventually did our degree. Yeah, you don't have to go that elitist route. You can do, we can merge. This division between academic and vocational annoys me as much as the division between academic and practice. We don't need to make that division. Um, my friend Tom Conlon that I do the fishing with, he, he wrote some great papers that really opened your, your mind up, but he put it this way, and you may have seen this before, but um, the technical rational approach, the technician focuses on the immediate task when, he's, when they're building a cathedral together and just laying the bricks one upon other. Workman two, crafts, is a craftsman with a larger plan and creating the north wall of the cathedral. So he sees how the bricks fit together in a bigger plan. Three is the visionary. I'm worshipping God. It's something bigger. There's a bigger picture. I think we've got all of those in us. We don't want to throw the technical rational out completely because we need organized processes at times. We need to know how we create the North Wall, that we have to have a vision. Without a vision, what is there? And Tom asked the question, what is education for? And I think I've been answering it over these slides. It's for us all. It's for the common wheel. It's for the good of each other. It's not about who gets the best exam results. There's Tom. So the technical rational approach is we just focus on the individual bricks. We don't see the bigger picture. We end up with hierarchy, individualism, elitism, alienation, bullying, exams. Some people say that's what grown-ups about. It need not be that way. We get 25% of children at least left behind without qualifications. So that academic with nothing there. So alienated by their experiences of school. And Tom put it pretty well. He said that um, when the going gets tough, these traits will harden. The drive for high standard then becomes one for standardization. Monitoring becomes surveillance. Accountability becomes subjugation. We leave the 25% behind because the school pushes to get that 75% and say, look at where we are in the league tables. We just work on certain groups who always had the advantages anyway. And Tom, I mean, I've noticed recently, people keep mentioning Illich. I see it when I go places. I see it on Newsnight Scotland. So maybe we need to revisit him. Maybe schools aren't the solution, or we need a different kind of schooling. The problem with this, this approach, this hierarchical approach, is that it pushes down. We've done this huge work in the early years, but there's a danger that we're going to be having schoolification of early years. There's a danger that the review of early years will result in a change in the pathway that we've been going. There's a whole group of people making a really good impact in early years. And this child, don't even get a few practice semesters before they get their grades. I thought it might amuse you to see something. This isn't the amusing one. This is hopefully the positive one. <laughs> the person laughing loudest is the teacher who wrote this report. So Jane Brady, now Watson. John is a very helpful boy and has no <laughs> trouble coping with his work. Very able at maths, handwriting, 
Variable at mass, handwriting needs improving, still does. <laughs> John has produced some mature work. This is the most positive. I, I couldn't show you them all, there wasn't time. This is the only positive one in primary school. My experience of this previous two years were so bad that I didn't re recognise the teacher's name on the report card when I saw it. Yeah. That's, I don't even remember what happened in the previous two years, but something changed this year. Very keen on badminton. A new teacher came with new ways of working. I hated the classroom. We learned outside the classroom. It was a sunny day, we went outside. We went into the playground or we went up to Braid Park. I did run away with uh, Jamie Murray one time and got into a bit of trouble because we got too excited with the freedom, but we won't go into that. Uh, but, but the teacher didn't write that down on the report card. She didn't write the one mistake I made all year on the report card. She wrote the positive stuff, sadly. <laughs> At school it got a little bit, high school it got a little bit less. There's a nice one, a very able pupil. So in modern studies, we had Dave Griffiths and Robin Harper who became the Green <coughs> MP and they just made it fun. It was fun, it was about politics, about changing the world and they, I'm standing here because they, I was hating school and they enlightened something in me. The only thing that kept me going was playing rugby. Or doing, I played all sorts of sports, football, badminton. Um, there's a lot of very good work about untidy in the physics. The lower one makes me laugh. This, this one was a year or two later. John can do well provided the, the, he concentrates on the work and does not allow himself to wander. <laughs> yeah. This is the teacher who didn't teach us physics, Jim Burns, lovely guy. And the th he let you call him Jim outside of school, I'll, I'll add that, I don't, we might want to work on that a bit as well. He didn't teach me physics, but he taught me a lot about politics. We talk about politics all day, so if you could, I spent the whole time trying to get him off the physics and onto the politics. <laughs> so I had great distraction techniques. Um, maths, disappointing results can do better. Hold on a minute ago in maths I was very good. Teacher I couldn't interact with. No relationship. I'm not saying he was a bad man. I, I, his name was Kennedy. I don't, I don't know if you... I can't remember his first name. And I don't think he was a bad man. He just couldn't communicate with me. So I just ooh, dropped off a bit. And I think it tells us something about what we need in our lives as young people to be stimulated, to feel included, to feel like the young person said earlier, they don't have to cuddle us, but they have to care. And luckily for me, people like Dave Corbin came along, joined Boromir, got us involved in the rugby. People who actually got me interested in stuff and kept me going were there. I, I could have gone either way. And I don't say this with any bravado. It's the people in this room who helped me go in a good direction. Yeah? And I thank you all. We're trying to bring this forward now, coming up to date. Um, we've written a paper uh, for the Reed Foundation on the way forward. And we're talking about things like how we would change the way we work, how we would change the role of adults and young people if we incorporated fully the UNCRC, if we didn't have things like school councils but actually had participatory approaches. Um, there's not time to go into this today, but the papers are up there. I do admit, however, that there's a there's a slight issue for me, but if you write it, we have to actually talk it as well. So today, hopefully, will we'll help in some ways about talking what a different approach looks like, what a common wheel looks like. On the Creanova project, we were looking at creativity and innovation. And, and Catherine's here from the, the School of Art. And um, we've been writing some stuff recently that's really uh, just right on the edge. It's new stuff. We're not sure. What, we write stuff and we're not sure what's coming out. But the debate, the dialogue helps the ideas come out. But underlying it's an idea that you need, you don't need to get, a, get rid of the technical altogether. You need to have flexible frameworks and design processes. We do not have the frameworks and processes to ensure that our schools are more equitable places all the time. School councils are not that. We're just playing at it. If we incorporate children's rights fully, we'll have to think about how we do it properly in schools. And if we don't start there, where are we going to start? And it's about children and adults changing and shaping processes, shaping the change process. 
agreeing outcomes, outcomes with adults. It's not adult rights and children's rights, it's human rights. We can work together. If we believe in something, we look at the positives in each other. Children and adults don't have to fight about this, we can work together. When you ask children in working class communities, what are the top things you want to change? They say, give my mum more money. Yeah, she's working two jobs just to get by. They don't pay. They don't ask for stuff for themselves, they ask for stuff for other people. It's about the connection. It's not about this. It's not about speak quietly to our friends. This came out of a school pupil council. Remember, I, I apologise to Kay and, and Karine and a couple others who've seen this recently. Tuck, tuck it, that's not children's rights, that's adults' manipulation. Yeah? <laughs> um, I didn't bore, I'm just as the conclusion, I didn't bore you with statistics today. Um, the, there's, there's loads of stuff out there in papers that have built into what I've said today. But people would say, where's your evidence? And I will say back, where's your philosophy? Where's your concept? Where's your belief? Yeah? All these politicians who do focus groups to find out what they believe. I don't need to do a focus group to find out what I believe. I built it, I understood it with other people in communities talking to me, as, as Rowena was saying, in the debate, in the understanding. Yeah? And I have a firm conviction about the way we need to go. And it's not mine. It's built on all these people that I've mentioned, and all you people in this room who have worked together over the years. Do we need evidence from some pilot study done in China or America? No, but we do have evidence. We have loads of evidence that the way that I've been talking about today works because we know the most equal countries in the world have the best outcomes. We know it. The evidence is there. So why are we ignoring it? Why do we let the politicians ignore it? If this referendum is about anything, it's about shifting people, waking up and starting to change things in people's lives. I have some sympathy. I, I get annoyed when I see people on TV going, I don't know about this. I don't have enough information. I think there's loads of, fucking, there's 600 pages in the SNP document. You know, there's loads of stuff out there. But the exception I would say is this. Is it in a format that people can grasp and understand? As we run up to the referendum, we need more debate in local communities talking about what these things are. But debate's not about whether you'll be 100 quid better off or 1,000 pounds better off, but about what will it look like? What will the framework, the design process, and what will our vision be? Not necessarily an SNP vision. I have great sympathy for independent. Well, I'm going to be voting yes, as I was about to say. Right, so the conclusion, a new policy of Scotland requires us to develop frameworks, enabling children and young people to influence and change issues in their lives. Those require, frameworks require appreciative, appreciative cooperation between children, young people and adults to define outcomes. A collective approach requires us to recognise the power of politics of our lives and be reflexive to enable change. Reflexivity, we think about it, we question ourselves, we have the dialogue and our way doesn't always win. Yeah, you change your view. We've come a long way, that's what the talk's kind of saying. When you look back across the work that I've looked back, we've come a long way. Some of the changes we need could happen under devolution and the people that wrote the read paper are not yes like me. So what's great about that is the debate doesn't have to be about us fighting each other. We managed to write a paper we all agreed on from different political perspectives. How's that, yeah? That's what Scotland, that's what a contemporary mature Scotland should be about. It's, it's not like other countries where they're tearing each other apart. We're doing this in a very Scottish way. Yeah. For me, these changes are unlikely to happen soon under devolution. That's my analysis. It's my gut feeling. No evidence. Nobody has evidence in this referendum debate. Yeah, it's my gut feeling. It's Westminster politics is gone. There's no place for people like me in it. I joined the Labour Party many years ago and it didn't last very long. Um, and I was glad and I had to leave because of the Blairites with no convictions. When we were in a meeting and they were arguing that we should have compulsory redundancies in the council, it's like, where's your conviction? Anyway, I'm, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> we need to take mature and courageous decisions 
close to, closer to home. That's my conclusion. If I go out to young people and I say you can be part of this common wheel, I don't see it happening unless we vote yes, is, is my analysis. But I'm willing to debate my pals who are here, particularly Liam Cairns, who's, who wants a federal approach. Is that right, Liam? Yeah. The final thing is this. There's a lot of people not in this room today who talk about social justice and don't practice it. What's great about all you guys who've turned up is we've had this journey. We know what it means to actually try and help people. Yeah? But there's a lot of people outside this room who talk about social justice who need to practice it. Thank you.